death. Um, he mentions Down syndrome uh, babies that sometimes are born with a certain defect of where their intestines are not attached to their colon, I believe, and that many parents, even though a simple surgery could fix this and the, the, the Down syndrome kid could survive, if they don't fix it, they die within a matter of days, um, that many parents choose to have passive euthanasia in this case. Um, they choose not to have the surgery, even though it would be simple. Now, that's passive euthanasia, but we all know they are refusing treatment for their child, and uh, Rachel's believes that they're not really doing it because of the treatment, they're doing it because they don't want a Down syndrome child. Um, and he believes, hey, passive euthanasia is not always great either. So don't think that this is always good and that's always bad. That's his first point. But then his major philosophical point he wants to make is, he believes that you, the distinction we have in the U.S. that this is okay and this is not, doesn't actually hold. He actually claims that either we have to accept both passive and active euthanasia as morally the same, okay, or we have to say that both of them are morally wrong. You can't have your cake and eat it too in this case. You can't say one is right and the other is wrong. You have to actually accept either one or the other. Now, if you're completely against all euthanasia and we have to allow patients to, you know, survive as long as we can, we have to force thin drugs in this case, so they're not even allowed to do passive. Um, if you're that against it, then you're, this is fine. But if you think passive is okay and this isn't, He's going to try to convince us that actually we have to go all the way and accept active as well. So let's see how he does it. And he does it with his famous Smith-Jones argument right here. Okay. And so now, in this case, we're going to talk about, now doctors we usually generally think in this profession have good intentions. They want to do what's best for their patient. Um, he even looks at the, you know, look at the, um, uh, the oaths we have to take, do no harm, right? Um, we want to do what's best. Okay. And this is a lot of times why people argue, well, you're doing harm by doing this. Um, but he thinks... They do. Doctors have good intentions. Whether they are committing active or passive, they do. But in this case, the first case we're going to look at is actually talk about bad intentions. So let's see what he, what he means by this. So take uh, Smith and Jones. So Smith, um, he has a, uh, a nephew, uh, well, let's say Smith's brother and his wife have just passed away in a horrible accident. And um, Smith is left to take care of his nephew, the son of his brother. Now the thing is, in the will for his, um, his nephew, is basically his nephew is guaranteed to get a lot of money once he turns 18. And that Smith can't have access to this. Now, if the nephew were to die, Smith would get it, but the nephew's going to way outlive Smith and he'll never see any of his money. So Smith is kind of upset at this, but he's thinking, maybe I could do something about this. And what Smith decides to do, and let's say the nephew's like four or five years old, the night that uh, Smith has to take care of the nephew, he said maybe an accident might happen. And as his nephew, uh, let's call him little Johnny, all right, is in the, uh, in the bathtub, Smith decides, you know, it's like, well, right when he goes to play with that rubber ducky, you know, Smith's going to go in and just like, uh, I'm just going to take his head, and we're just going to hold him underwater lightly. You know, he's only five years old, and it won't take very much, very little force. And after a few minutes, the kid's going to drown. We'll make it look like an accident, and Smith will get all the money. Okay? So he's going to do that. Now, bad intentions by Smith. Definitely. The action he committed is bad. And the outcome is bad as well. So we would all get No one's going to say Smith's a good guy at all. This is actually a horrible thing. Immoral thing. Now let's take Jones. Jones is in the exact same situation. Has a nephew... Uh, has a chance a lot of money, but the nephew's going to get it for Jones, and so Jones comes with the same plan that when his nephew, little Johnny, takes a bath tonight, I'm going to just hold my hold his head down like that and let him drown, and I'll make it look like an accident, and Jones will get all the money. That's his intention. So he goes up there with the intention to do it, but this time, right as little Johnny gets ready to play with the rubber ducky, little Johnny slips up, hits his head in the back of the tub, and then falls in, and Jones just kind of walks back like that, all right? Um, and of course, little Johnny dies. Now the question is, is Jones a morally worse person than Smith? Is he worse? You know, because think about it, Jones didn't do anything, right? Jones didn't, didn't cause his death, didn't do anything like he intended him to die, but in the end, little Johnny slipped up on his own, he really did nothing, right? And so, I mean, is Jones a better person than Smith, or are they both pretty evil and both horrible people equally? That actually Smith and Jones have committed an action that is both equally as reprehensible. And I think Rachel's believes that we all have to say that these are equally as reprehensible. Just because Jones didn't necessarily push him down, by Jones not doing anything, Jones' actual not doing anything caused the death of the kid. Just like Smith, by holding him down, caused the death of the kid. Jones could have easily stopped doing that and pick the kid up. Smith could have easily left his hand off and let the kid come to the water as well. Both of them have done something morally as wrong, okay? And none of them's worse than the other. Now, how is this supposed to work with this case? Well, now let's take a look at doctors, okay? You have maybe uh, the doctor who is practicing passive versus the doctor who is practicing active. Both of them, Rachel's claimed, have the same intention. This time it's not bad intentions, it's good intentions, okay? They both want what's best for their patient. But the doctor who commits passive decides to take the medicine away, or, um, 
and do nothing, okay? Like just let the patient die. Whereas the uh, doctor who commits active decides to actively, with the patient's choice of course, give them this uh, medicine that kills them. Well, let's look at it. Wouldn't they morally be the same too? They both have good intentions. The outcome is the same. In passive, yes, the doctor does nothing, but by doing nothing, it brings about that outcome, much like we had with Jones over here. And active, the outcome the same, but the person's actively doing something and doing it, much like Smith. In this case here, we said there was no moral difference. Why would there be a moral difference here? And so this is why Rachel's believes that actually, in the end, since the outcome's the same, the intentions are the same, okay? Yes, the methods are, are different, but he, James really believes that when you do nothing, you are doing something. That's an action. To not do something is to do something, okay? And just like the active who, you know, you give the patient this lethal dose, the doctor who commits passive is doing something by doing nothing, which we all know brings about the death. And so what he's trying to say is that if you have a problem with pa or a problem with active but not passive, that doesn't make sense because in the end, they are the same thing morally. They are in any, any difference. So if you're okay with this, you must be okay with that. Or if you're not okay with this and you're okay with that, then you have to rethink and can't be okay with any of them. You either have to accept both or neither because morally they are the same. Now that's his argument in a nutshell. It's a pretty good argument. I, li I like this one. My class generally likes to talk about this one just because it's such a strange example, but it does I think, show a good point. The final thing he points out, though, and once we have now determined that these are morally equivalent, then we can start looking at circumstantial and consequential evidence about different situations about which one is better. And Rachel believes that you know once we say there are the, these are two types of um, treatments that we can use, both are equally good, but in some cases this one might be the better consequential treatment, and in other cases this one might be the better consequential treatment. Um, and he points to like cases where someone is suffering. Um, they are having, you know, a something like, you know, a really, you know, let's say uh, ALS or uh, a cancer that is eating away their body. Um, you might have in those cases that active might be better instead of letting them suffer and experience this. Even though um, you might be hopped up on morphine and other things like that for care and palliative treatment, some may prefer this over that because it decreases the amount of suffering that has to happen. Um, this also got Rachel in some hot water because he's claimed that perhaps active euthanasia might be better in some cases of where we pull the plug, like Terry Schiavo. Even though she has no choice in it, we pull the plug, she starved to death for eight days before she died. Um, and is that, you know, should we allow patients to suffer in that way, or would it be better thing is pull the feeding tube and give her something that killed her? Now, of course, we're now getting the legal means of the doctor giving it, but Rachel suggests that maybe once we understand they're both the same, maybe those consequential things should come into play. That's James Rachel's. Now, so we don't run out of time here, let's look at Bonnie Steinbach. And Bonnie Steinbach is arguing against uh, James Rachel's article here. Now, the first thing you'll see in her, in her essay is she uh, is actually with agreement on Rachel's on some things. For example, passive euthanasia. She agrees that this whole thing about, we mentioned about Down syndrome kids and passive euthanasia being used for the wrong reasons, not the right ones, is a horrible mistreatment of what it is. But for Steinbach, it's just mind-blowing, okay, that Rachel's response is, okay, passive is misused. Well, then let's go and just try to make even more euthanasia use. For her, she thinks that's the total wrong way to look at it. For her, is that we see not only is passive misuse, but if we allow active, that's going to be misused too. And so the goal is not to allow more euthanasia, but we should be decreasing it. And for her, we should be actually be doing uh, not allowing passive euthanasia in many instances as well, that we should be watching it and containing it instead of allowing it more. And then she uh, attacks the argument here about they're both the same or not. She thinks that really isn't the case either. And her argument is one based on intentions, that she believes that intentions matter in this case, where Rachel assumed that the intentions of the doctors were the exact same in this case, and that's why we could equate them as morally equivalent. They both wanted what's best for their patient. She says it's not really the case. In fact, in the case of passive, she believes the doctor's intention isn't to kill the patient. In fact, it's just to give them their right to refuse treatment, which is a right that we all have here in the United States. You can refuse treatment any time. Now, that does end up bringing about their death, but the doctor doesn't intend for them to die. Maybe they hope for a miracle, or, or they know that's a, 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 you know, a possibility, but in their mind, all they are doing right now is I'm tending to give you your right to refuse. Whereas in the, pay, uh, the doctor in active euthanasia, he thinks it's always to kill them. Hands down, when I give them this lethal treatment, my intention is to kill this person. And she says that shows there's a different intention between the doctors, and that should be a morally relevant thing we should think about and should keep us from believing that these two are the exact same. Intentions matter, she believes. Now, I will agree with her. I think intentions do matter. I mean, uh, if we, we can take a look at lecture on Kant, we can see why intentions should matter in cases of moral arguments. Um, but I guess 
my counter would be to this is to do something like Jack Kevorkian. Um, and his famous quote is, there's nothing wrong with death, right? And that we should, when terminally ill, have a right to die. You know, whereas we, the doctor gives us the intention, the, uh, or gives us the uh, right to refuse, why couldn't one have a right to die? Now, of course, yes, the, the intention still may be the doctor killing them, and we have to look at that, but you know, should we have that right or not? Um, I think she makes some good points, but I, I mean, that's a question we should look at. Does one have a right to die when terminally ill? Um, you know, I have six months left to live, but it's going to be horrible. Should I have a right to take life into my own hands or not? That's what we're looking at here, right? Um, but I do want to finish on this, and just to give Bonnie Steinbach some credit, and just, you know, just to look at this all together. Um, there was a reading we used to do in our old class by Thomas Sullivan. If you want to check him out, we didn't make his, I didn't make anyone do it, but it, you might be interested. And he ends uh, by talking about how, you know, many doctors and nurses will point to, um, will point to the claim that, hey, you have to just trust them. They see these patients all the time. And many doctors and nurses will believe that active euthanasia is okay. It's like, you don't see the pain they go through. You don't see the things they have to do, that this would be better off. Thomas Sullivan makes a point, he says, maybe doctors and nurses are the worst people we should be talking to about this. It's because they are so emotionally connected to the things going on that uh, they can't really make a rational and non-emotional, non-biased uh, 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 argument for the case. they letting the emotions get to them. And yes, Thomas Sullivan, they may have good intentions, but in the end, they may still be committing murder. And the best people that should be looking at this are philosophers, not the nurses and doctors. And he ends with this uh, famous proverb that says, um, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think what we mean by it is that we may have good intentions. Rachel's may have good intentions. The doctor may have good intentions. In fact, the person doing it may have good intentions. But in the end, we still may pave the road to hell with it. Okay? It still may be wrong. So think about that as well. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, in the end, yeah, I'll let you decide on what you think is correct. But just make sure you understand Steinbach and Rachel's and the difference between these two types of euthanasia. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And I will see you next time. Thank you.